So let's extend our idea of the Fourier transform. So in a previous video, we looked at the Fourier cosine transform. And that Fourier can cosine transform, just as Fourier series, is good for even functions. What about odd functions? If I have an odd function, is there such a thing as a Fourier sine transform? Since the sine itself is odd as well. And certainly there is. So there is something called the Fourier sine transform. And it looks very similar to the Fourier cosine transform, honestly. So we write f of x as the square root of 2 over pi, integral from 0 to infinity, f hat s of w, sine of wx dw. And that f hat s of w is like the b sub n in your Fourier series, your usual sine version of the Fourier series. Uh, notice also there's a subscript, subscript of s for sine, and a subscript c for cosine. Um, and just as with the Fourier cosine transform, we call f hat s the Fourier sine transform of our function f of x. We can compute this by a formula that looks very similar, the square root of 2 over pi, integral from 0 to infinity, f of x sine of wx dx. So, as with the Fourier cosine transform, it's still difficult to compute this by hand. So you almost always will end up looking it up on a computer or in a table. Let's talk a little bit more about the usage of these transforms, the Fourier transforms. So, uh, mainly, one of the major uses is, as we discussed, you can interpret the Fourier cosine and the Fourier sine transforms uh, roughly as the amplitude uh, as the, of the frequency uh, w that makes up your function. There is, however, another usage of the Fourier transform. So uh, it's used sometimes like the Laplace transform. Namely, the Laplace transform was used to solve certain differential equations. And so a Fourier transform can also be used to solve certain types of differential equations. Uh, this will be done later. We're not going to do that in this video. OK, but what if you have a general function, f of x, which is neither even nor odd? What do you do? Well, you know that you can always write a uh, series for a function that's neither even nor odd. And so let's talk about how you do that and then how you change that into the general Fourier transform. So in general, you can always write the Fourier series for any function um, in a region from negative L to L, and then periodic outside of that, as f of x is equal to a naught plus a sum over cosine plus a sum over sines. But we can actually make this a little bit easier. If you recall that cosine can be written in terms of complex exponentials, e to the ix plus e to the minus ix over 2. And sine of x can also be written in terms of complex exponentials. Then we can rewrite this whole series, f of x, as one big sum from n equal to negative infinity to infinity, c sub n e to the i n pi over l x, where note now that the sum includes n from negative infinity to infinity. So you have negative numbers in the n's, whereas previously we only had positive facts. The c sub n um, is in general, in this case, complex. So for instance, you the first few terms in the series would be c0 plus c1 e to the i pi over l x c sub minus 1 e to the minus i pi o over lx, c sub 2 e to the 2 pi over lx times i, and c sub minus 2 e to the minus i 2 pi over lx, et cetera, et cetera. So you get all of the positive and negative terms in the exponentials. You can calculate the coefficients by a Fourier series type of integral from negative l to l, f of x e to the minus i n pi over lx dx. So that looks like our usual type of integral. One thing it's worth noting is that this uh, expression for the coefficients includes n equal to 0. Before we move on, let's talk about a few fun facts about the c sub n coefficients in the complex 
Fourier series. So in general, as we just mentioned, the C sub n coefficients are complex. Um, also, if f of x is a real function, which it almost always will be for us, then c sub n and c sub minus n are actually complex conjugates. That might not be immediately obvious, but uh, if you stare at that expression for c sub n long enough, you can figure that out. Um, if f of x is real and even, it turns out we know even more, then c sub n is equal to c sub minus n, and actually, these are all real numbers. In contrast, if f of x is real and odd, then c sub n is equal to minus c sub minus n, and these are pure imaginary coefficients. Okay, so these are just some fun facts that are useful to know about the c sub n's. Okay, from this, it's easy to go to the idea of the complex Fourier transform, because we can just take L go to infinity, and then, as before with Fourier transforms, it turns our sum into an integral. And so we call this the complex Fourier transform, where we write f of x as 1 over the square root of 2 pi, integral from negative infinity to infinity, f hat of w, e to the i wx dw. Uh, notice that there's a different convention for the complex Fourier transform, which is annoying. So there's, this convention includes a 1 over square root of 2 pi. So just be aware of that. Uh, and now there's the f hat of w, which is kind of like the c sub n's in the complex Fourier series. And we call f hat of w the complex Fourier transform of our function f of x. We can compute these coefficients by a similar looking integral. So you do an integral from negative infinity to infinity, f of x e to the i wx dx. And as with the other Fourier transforms, computing this in general is not particularly easy, um, and so you generally just look it up in a computer or in a table. But let's take a minute to try and interpret the Fourier transform, the complex Fourier transform, and gain some intuition for what it's telling you. So let's consider again f of x, something that looks like cosine of x. So it has a period of just pi. And we want to interpret what does the Fourier transform of this look like, f hat of w. Well, it's going to be a spike, it turns out, at negative 1 and a spike at positive 1. And the reason we know that is, well, by what we mean by the Fourier transform, this is something like e to the minus ix plus e to the plus ix, which is something like cosine x. So it's going to look roughly like this, a spike at negative 1 and 1. Okay, so what happens if we try and make these spikes? We've always been using these spikes to get some intuition. What happens if we let these spikes or peaks broaden? So instead of a sharp spike at negative 1 and 1, let's have a fairly broad spike at negative 1 and 1. So again, this is hard to do analytically, so let's use a computer to try and understand what this should look like. Uh, Briefly, we know that since we're including more frequencies, this is not just going to look like a cosine. So we do this on a computer, and here I've already got it set up. So as I adjust the slider to make the peaks broaden, it turns my cosine function into something that's just like a localized wave, so a little wave just at one point. As the peaks are sharper, it becomes more like just a cosine everywhere. And as the peaks broaden, then it focuses the cosine at one point. So if I were to draw this f of x here, let me just quickly draw this, what it would look like. So I've got a wave with amplitude that decreases as you go further out. So let me draw a dotted line for the envelope outside of that. Um, this actually looks a little bit uh, like something from a different context of physics, kind of like a wave packet. Um, and a wave packet is the idea of like a localized wave, um, some wave that's just in one location. And so it turns out there's some interesting deep connections to quantum mechanics, uh, which you should ask your quantum mechanics teacher about.